Hey, how's it going? So I'm going to just talk about. S I think it's okay. No. Yeah, she's not a female. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, I'm just going to talk about some of my projects. I probably won't talk as long as I intended, so don't worry. Um, once this appears magically. Actually, one of them looks remarkably like the mobile monuments. But, uh, this is called Door, and it was there. That's fine. This is called Door, and it's a project I did for uh, Cork Midsummer Festival. What's going on? Cork Midsummer Festival in 2011. It was a musical door that two performers trundled around the city. Why is that doing that? Um, the two performers trundled around the city and uh, stopped periodically to perform on. So it's a few pictures of them in Cork City during the Midsummer Festival. And there you go. This is, I don't want to talk about this actually. This is <laughs> Fatima, this is Fatima phone, an adult simmer I built on the eve of, for the eve of the Fatima Mansion's flats destruction. This is a model of the flats uh, over which I strung wire that I collected around the, from debris around the site. These are buckets containing rubble from the site and they provided tension for the strings that ran across the model of the buildings. This is a close-up of the models that serve as the bridges for the dulcimer instrument. So I kind of played this. It's a bit of a disaster of a performance, to be honest with you. It was raining. You see the awning there. There was literally water co collecting in that awning, and we had to keep letting it go. So anyway, that was Fatima Phone. It was called Fatima Phone. This is the brass picnic, where 16 uh, waiters met well, stood with 16 brass players at different points in the city and 16 guests met each of them at these different points. They were served some food, given a solo brass performance, and then they upped and moved to a new location where they met another performer, another guest, and another waiter, had another bit of food, had a duet performance, got up, and you can imagine they moved to another spot, met two more performers, two more waiters, two more guests and had a quartet, then an octet, then ultimately all 16 brass players played in a circle with a concentric ring inside of guests and waiters and they had a final 16, it was four quartets basically, 16 brass players. So that was for the 2005 uh, Fringe Festival. This is Storm in a Teacup, a performance I did where people listened to a, my, actually my son's heartbeat governed the tempo of the performance um, it, through teacups that I'd built um, with speakers in each of them. Uh, it was in the Cake Cafe. This is the one I remarked on that was similar to the monument. This is from 2010. Uh, the Joculator, my electroacoustic vehicle, which um, I unfortunately didn't buy a trike. I built the trike, which is pretty stupid because you can buy them. But mine was a front end one, so it was a bit different. So in, within this cabin, I had amplifiers, speakers, um, recording equipment, all powered by my own pedaling. Again, I stupidly built that myself. The whole non-reversible, you know, the whole diode and everything to protect the battery, but you can just buy them now as kits. Um, so uh, actually, the first time I drove it, it collapsed, but it was like uh, the sailing of the Titanic. And uh, in this vehicle, I could record uh, sounds from the environment, uh, put them into a composition and perform the piece on the move. So that was my idea uh, for that year. This is the Evolva phone. There are a lot of phones in my life. I have one more. Uh, this is uh, a booth that was in the Science Gallery in Trinity College, then it moved on to the Monshire Museum of Science in, in North America, in the United States. Um, two people went into the booth and input their initials into a bell jar display, a kind of Victorian bell jar display and a algorithm um, generated a composition based on the laws of natural selection from those initials in their Morse code equivalents. So it's a lot of doo -doo 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 -doo, you know, this kind of thing. That's the geneticist that I worked with, Aoife McClyset, Dr. Aoife McClyset. And this is what I consider my masterpiece, yet to, yet to be realized, it's the Kahugaphone. It's a machine designed not to work, an instrument that doesn't make a noise, and I've built it in several several different incarnations, but I haven't quite got it right yet. Someday I will. It's my Kahuga phone. My Kahuga phone is like my life. So, built of nonsense, compromise, and strife. 
So this is, uh, I just wanted to talk quickly about a project and slides have disappeared, but that's fine. Um, most recent project with, I'm working on a PhD currently, music for deaf audiences, and I just wanted to talk about how it began, and maybe it's helpful for people developing projects. Um, I wanted to work with deaf individuals and learn about their musical experience. Um, so I got in touch with a deaf choir. These are all um, mental, these slides. Uh, but I got in touch with the Dublin Deaf Choir, and I was really excited because I thought I was going to be learning about how deaf people sing, but it turned out they were a signing choir, which was a surprise to me, um, and they, it was a surprise to them. But I decided to build them a vibrating chair so that we could learn if vibrations, extra auditory vibrations, were of interest musically to deaf individuals. So I built my vibrating chair with vibrating speakers. You can see them in either arm there, and on the posterior region of the chair, and the back of the chair, and that's my son sitting in the chair. And then I got the members of the choir to sit in the chair, and I think they had an experience somewhere between the terrifying and the erotic, unfortunately, because <laughs> it was mainly because of this crucial speaker I was referring to before. Uh, it wasn't a great success, and there's the choir director in the chair, and she really said to me, probably when that picture was taken, George, why don't you take your chair to St. Mary's School for Deaf Girls? And that's what I did where I met with a far more um, interested audience, in fairness, in music, because they had a long tradition of music at St. Mary's School for Deaf Girls um, it, since the nuns started the school. I learned about, a lot about hearing loss. I'm not going to talk about this because you guys are hungry. Um, I learned basically that there are degrees of deafness rather than sort of people being deaf or not deaf or hearing. So we all have a degree of deafness, I suppose. And assistive technologies like cochlear implants blur that uh, connection more, that's Evelyn Glennie. I built an instrument for the girls to perform on, um, and this is us performing in Contemporary Music Center. But um, ultimately, I wanted to say that was the score I made with um, sign for one of the, um, signing for one of the performers there, uh, sign language symbols instead of notation. But ultimately, I wanted to say that this turned into what was called the Lost and Found Sound Assembly, which was a public art piece, an outdoor piece whereby we built a, an instrument, and the building of the instrument was an act of compositional or musical performance as well, tactile, visual, um, an aural. In the middle there is a little walkway uh, which the audience members could walk through. There's, I'm guiding my daughter through um, there, and the, this walkway vibrated, um, and the girls activated the, the vibrations from these little telegraph displays, and that's the last picture I'll show you. That was a highly abbreviated version of my talk, but I think you'll appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you.